four losses in a row for the Indiana Pacers, whose defense is falling apart, whose communication is not there, and they have a lot to figure out. We'll talk about it all today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Tuesday, y'all, and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI, and today, four straight losses for the Pacers. Yikes, they are not playing well. Their tone after the game suggests that they get it, they know it, they've got to be better, but they're not. They have lost four games in a row. For a reason, and the defensive side of the ball, of course, to blame, as it is almost, in fact, I would say every single time the Pacers have lost the game this season, 151 by the Clippers. And that's the third highest <laughs> Pacers opponent this season with the Hawks and Celtics zooming over that. What went wrong for the Pacers in this game, short of everything? Um, what have, what's going on with team slowing down Halbert and all of a sudden what went right? Shots have been Mather and Isaiah Jackson. And I have to hold myself accountable sometimes. I got some rotation predictions wrong before the season, and I want to talk about it and why I did not correctly predict who would be playing and how much, because I think it'll be an interesting exercise in what the Pacers are doing and why they're making the choices they are making. We start, of course, with Pacers Clippers, where the Clippers destroyed the Pacers 151-127, the final score. The Pacers were ahead after the first quarter. They were ahead for most of the second quarter, and then the Clippers were so much better than them. For the final 30 minutes of this game, it wasn't even close. Clippers lead got up to 33 late in the fourth quarter of this game. So uh, caveat numero uno, Clippers shot 50% from three. The last two Pacers opponents have shot 50% or better from three. That's ridiculous. You're not going to win playing a team that shoots 50% from three. You just lose when that happens. But the Pacers are kind of doing it to themselves, right? Like their defense is allowing these open shots and you don't expect teams to shoot that well, but it, they're making it as easy as possible, right? Like Ben Matherin, I think used the perfect word. The presence is not there for the Pacers defensively. And it hasn't been all season. Their defense is just, just terrible for most of the season. And they know they need to fix it. Like Carlisle's talking about it after the game. He's a part of the, the issues here too, right? And they've got to take responsibility for their poor defense. But the the stretch recently, like, it's really interesting to look at this four-game losing streak. Uh, after tonight's game's Pacers have fallen back behind the Charlotte Hornets, they are 29th in defense again. A percentage points head of the Wizards for dead last. So that's not good. Um, their presence is not good. They're not doing the right stuff. I just mentioned everything that is going poorly. But they they just have to, have to, have to find a way to be a little better. So here's the thing about this losing streak and all these teams putting up big nights and beating the Pacers by double digits. I thought they would lose to the Bucs. I predicted so before the season, right? Especially with the in-season tournament run, to come down from that emotionally is tough. Like they played Detroit in the first game, they could win that. But Minnesota, end of a road trip on a back-to-back. -back. Like that's about as scheduled of a loss as there is. And that was before the season when I predicted the Pacers would lose that. We didn't even know at the time Minnesota was going to be amazing, right? And then coming back home, playing a good Clippers team who we didn't know would have James Harden, it's still like a road game because there's travel leading into it. I predicted a loss there. Those three like were expected results to me. But the problems are two. There's two things that make this losing streak extremely problematic, especially with the defense. Thing one is they've given up a ton of points in these games, right? They look, they have looked terrible defensively in these games so it's not just like that they lost like it's not like they lost by a few points right it's not like they lost by two three four whatever and you could talk about late game execution or like if they just scored a little more the defense wouldn't have mattered all that is true in some cases but certainly not the case uh in this stretch 127 for minnesota who did not score well in the first half 151 for the clippers 137 for the wizards 140 for the bucks right so that's weird and a problem, certainly. And I think that what makes that so weird to me is, and part of what I've talked about. Oh, and the other thing about the losing streak, sorry. They lost the Wizards, 
if they just beaten the Wizards, the at least the vibes would be good, right? They could feel like, yeah, we're not playing great, but like we weren't supposed to beat these teams, but we've beaten the teams we're supposed to beat. We're 14 and 11. Like, okay. Instead, they're 13 and 12 and just like, oh my gosh, they can't beat or stop anybody. So they have to improve on defense. Duh, we know that. The thing that makes it strange to me right now is, and there's like reasons for this, and they're not good reasons. It's still like bad that the Pacers are having these things happen to them, is they, in the in-season tournament, right, the Celtics game that they won, they defended like fine at times in that game. Would they give up 112? I, I should have it up, right? Like dead stretches in that game, you're like, it's not great, but this is like a clear step forward defensively. This is the most damning with faint praise thing I've ever said out loud. But like they they did climb defensively in early December, right? They went from last to like third to last. <laughs> and that, that's not a compliment. That's just a fact that happened. And they were like doing a little better, right? And against the Bucks, they did a little better. And against the Lakers, it was and they got oversized pretty badly and gave up 123. But like you could tell, like the efforts there, defensive presence is there, like some meaningful things are happening defensively in a way that you think maybe they're turning the corner from terrible to like bad, you know, and that's not good, but that's a step forward that they needed. And I was thinking about that because I kept hearing people talk about it when they would talk about the Pacers. Right. And I thought that was interesting. Gave up 110 or excuse me, 114 to Portland. Like there were some decent defensive games in that run up 119 to the Bucks. I, I don't have to run through all of them, but you get it. And then that's all gone. Like the goodwill built up from those games has already evaporated. There, There's no reason to ever think that they will, at least as it stands, climb up from where they are defensively. We have over a quarter season of evidence that this is just what they are, and they don't have a long stretch of sustained good play in them. They have a three-game stretch, four-game stretch of it. So against the Clippers, who they played tonight, this concern is back, and they're going to have a practice now on Tuesday, certainly to address some of this stuff. But you could just hear it tonally, right? Like Rick Carlisle was talking about responsibility and energy and effort and potentially tweaking things so that they always have more energy and effort on the floor, whether that's lineups, whether that's how they prep for games. And that's on him. He admitted that, right? Like lots of stuff could be changes. He said the lineup word like that is always a sign of like, we're thinking uh, we realize how bad we are. Like we realize we got to fix something here, right? Tyrese Halberton, who had his worst offensive game of the season as well. We'll talk about that. Said, I can't play like this on a consistent basis. He knows that he needs to be better. He said this on both ends, right? Everybody on the Pacers struggled defensively in this game. Now, Miles Turner didn't play. Andrew Nemhard didn't play. That's two of their best three defensive players this season, maybe. Neesmith being the other one in that mix, right? That hurts. But th this was on, like atrocious, right? The Clippers shot 57%, 50% from the field. So they were really scorching it they were 56 for 98 from the field right so they were 37 for 60 on twos right like they were making everything they got to the line 23 times they cleaned up on the glass they had more offensive rebounds of the pacers they didn't turn it over that much like there was just M matherin's word is perfect there was no presence there was no pressure there was no sustained effort like i heard other people who were talking about the pacers defense when it went from awful to like pretty bad instead which is like again that's bad it's still a bad thing but it is improvement it was like the effort was there the closeouts were better the focus was there it's all gone all that's gone the clippers tore them up and of course the the one thing was going to be and scott agnes tweeted this during the game right this was a clear thing that was going to happen they have two giant wings the pacers can't guard those guys and that's bad um which one was going to kill them the answer was both leonard and george combined for 55 points but, like, you kind of expect that. You'd hope that you could slow them down. Like, 9 for 21 for PG is not awesome. But to, you know, Zubach with 18 and 16, and he's kicked the Pacers butt before. And then Harden to just go bananas in the fourth quarter. 21 fourth quarter points for Harden on his way to 35 and 9. And Norm Powell was on fire. And Westbrook shot it well. And like, it, everybody was feeling it and had space because the Pacers defense wasn't there. They're not communicating well. They're not defending well. Right. TJ McConnell says like said after the game, like they're kind of doing the scheme stuff, right? They're just not doing it or excuse me. They're doing, they're executing the scheme. They're just not doing it well enough. Their energy, the effort's not there. Like they got to be better at defense. This is known, but it has to be beaten in even harder, especially to me with the tonal shift we heard after this game, like, it's eaten at him now that they've lost four in a row. 
And the in-season tournament certainly is like a dramatic, emotional come down after it. Like they've talked about that a little bit. It's hard to adjust. They have a target on their back now, but that's not why they're losing. <laughs> you know, they're playing terrible on defense. They have some nice offensive things happening. They've had some guys who don't normally step up, show signs of growth. That's all important, but they, uh, uh, to be rehashed the talking point from all season, their defense is just atrocious. They are not defending well. No one is like out, sh short of Neesmith McConnell. Nobody defended well in this game. Nobody had presence. Nobody was giving the effort that was needed. And there were just a lot of open shots for the Clippers. They have to be better on the end of the floor. We'll see what kind of tweaks they make, if any, to be better. Or if it's just, guys, we got to lock in. We got to get more from ourselves. We'll see what happens come Wednesday when they play the Hornets. Some other stuff went poorly for the Pacers in this game. On offense, from a lineup perspective, from how they're being defended, we still have a lot to talk about. Tyrese Halburn's lowest scoring game of the season, under 10 points for the first time in 2023. 24. We still have a lot to talk about here on the Lockdown Pacers podcast. But before we do so, I'm going to talk about the lovely people over at eBay Motors who have partnered with Lockdown Fantasy Basketball host Josh Lloyd to bring you some of the best fantasy picks each week all season long. How about that? Whether you are prepping for a daily draft or scouting the waiver wire in your league every week, we here at Lockdown are going to provide you players that are guaranteed to fit on your roster. So let's see who Josh has picked out for us this week. And eBay's guaranteed fit Fantasy picks of the week. How about a guy the Pacers just played against? James Wiseman with the Pistons. Isaiah Stewart is hurt. Wiseman's putting up numbers the last couple of games. There's not a lot of confidence in him, but the numbers are good. Braden Pajemski, a guy I loved in the draft, had in the lottery, killing it for the Warriors. Another one looking comfortable as a starter now for Golden State. Widely available in fantasy leagues. Contributes across the board. Tari Eason, a beast for the Rockets. Grayson Allen who's going to be now in a bigger role with Bradley Beal out. Malachi Branham with the Spurs. All good options in fantasy from Josh Lloyd. And he hosts Locked on Fantasy Basketball. And Josh can help you win your fantasy championship. While eBay Motors knows a championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. It's the same with your vehicle. I miss my first car. I absolutely loved that thing. It's a shame that you have to upgrade as life goes on. But you have to take care of your car to keep it running. And you have to upgrade things to the parts that you want eBay Motors is your go-to there. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you can make sure that your ride stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED, headlights, roof racks, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. So you are burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, exclusions apply. Back here. Unlocked on Pacers. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. Check out Lockdown NBA to hear the latest and greatest from around the association. Big win for the Bulls, fun win for the Knicks. Talking Pacers and Clippers. And I hosted the show with Matt Moore today. So if you want to hear me talk more about the rest of the games in the league, that is the place to do it. We continue here talking Pacers Clippers, fourth loss in a row for the Pacers. Over six minutes of garbage time. James Johnson. The human white flag, six and a half minutes played in this game. And it's not fair to call him that today, actually. The Pacers were extremely limited in the creativity they could have. This is not why they lost. This is just a reality of the game. They were extremely limited from a rotation perspective. They were already down Jalen Smith <clears throat> and Andrew Nimhard, still dealing with their injuries. And the G League showcase starts this week. So the Mad Ants, who are killing it, they won 12 in a row. Uh, they're 13 and one. I might, they might be 13 in a row and they're 14 and one. They're, they're absolutely killing it. They've been phenomenal. The only game they lost, they like blew it at the fourth quarter too. They look amazing. G League showcases this week. They've got a good chance to win it. And they took Shibwe with them. And then they took Jarris Walker and Ben Shepard down for more reps, which is great. They play uh, at noon on Tuesday, I believe, is their first game of that. So they have five Pacers, and that could be fine. The Pacers have managed without. Nemhard and Smith, but then Miles Turner in the afternoon has a hamstring problem. I can't remember the exact phrasing of what this hamstring problem was. I have to scroll through my own Twitter feed to find it. It wasn't called just a hamstring injury. Uh, Miles Turner had a sore bilateral hamstring. So now they're down all three two A guys: Nemhard, Smith, and Turner. That's six. They they just started dropping like flies. Tyrese Halliburton was able to play. 
but they were also no Ben Shepard and Jarris Walker who were on assignment as well. They were down eight of their 18 guys. So 10 available players for the Pacers healed top end. Jackson starts at center, Bruce Brown and Halliburton were the starters. Neesmith, Mather and McConnell were the key bench guys. And then in the third quarter, when the Clippers got their lead going, Jordan war got into the rotation. I thought he might play in the first half. So that was their nine tonight. That's no, that's fine ish, but they definitely lost a lot at center. Now Isaiah Jackson was phenomenal, so they didn't lose a ton, but either way, that definitely shifted like the way they could play. That's not why they lost. They got their butt kicked. But they could, I mean, they couldn't stop the big wings as normal. But a lot, this has been a trend ish, trend ish. Just keep an eye on this, listeners. Tyrese Halberton, the way he's getting defended is a little different. And some of that is, is because he's been amazing. And some of that's because like guys haven't punished having weaker defenders on them on this Pacers team, right? Bruce Brown, Buddy Healed, although Buddy Healed. Bouncing back today, 14 points on nine shots. Um, still definitely needs to be better. Like, they haven't quite punished those matchups in a way that you'd hope if you're the Pacers. And so, like, <clears throat> you're seeing teams right on the inbounds. They send a guy to just flash up at Halberton, right? Get in his way. Because then he can't look up the court and, like, make his reads and, and rush things in a way that's productive for the Pacers. And then when he is across the half-court line, he's – seeing more bodies and they're not letting him do his pick and roll from as far to the side. So you can get going to his right all the time. And like all this little stuff that makes life harder for him. And he can't have as many drives. He's not getting as much pressure on the rim. Tyrese Halberton's last four games now played 14 points in Detroit. He had 16 assists. He was still good. 14 points in Detroit, 22 in Milwaukee, 19 in Washington. And tonight eight, a season low eight, the first time below 10, he had that phenomenal run. Right before this, I'm not trying to say that Tyrese Halberton's not playing well or isn't a good player. Like his seven games before the four I just said, he was averaging 32 and 13. Right, like Tyrese Halberton's a ridiculous player, but the way he's being defended in that presence, combined with he was sick and had this injury and a lot going on, like he hasn't been as effective. He'll say it, and he did not feel good about his performance after the game. He wants to be better, and he has to be better. Some of it is the way he's being defended, though. He's seeing different attention, and he actually likes that. He, The way he talked about it after the game was like, part of what I like about the NBA is the chess match of all those adjustments. And so he said, I'll figure it out. And he's got to. He's got to. Because, yeah, the Pacers scored 127 tonight. That's great. That's right at their average, right, which tops the league, but their defense obviously wasn't good enough. They got points from other guys. We'll talk about them. But if Halberton's getting that kind of defensive attention, he's three for 12. He was one for five from deep. He had good assist numbers. But the Pacers didn't shoot it that well. Like that hurts them so much. He is so much of their identity. So they've got to find a way to get him alive. And if he's going to have that attention, other guys have to, have to, have to seize the space and score. Matherin's been doing that, but they need more of it from other guys. Credit to the Clippers for that, though. They have a lot of size. They have a lot of talent. They're really good. They they deserve a lot of credit for the way that they played. Okay, a couple other things from this game that were a little more on the positive side. Pacers got smoked by the Wings. Um, also, a small thing about Tyrese Halbert, credit to him after his worst scoring game of the season. He still takes a stand, gets on the podium, talking about his team, talking about the struggles, what he's doing bad, what the team is doing bad. Like, the stars take that accountability, hop up on the stand and talk, even after they didn't play well or the team doesn't play well. I, as a media person, appreciate that. I think that says a lot about him as a leader as well. Okay. Ben Matherin gets a fantastic from me. He was awesome on offense. He's making all the right decisions, whether to shoot the threes, which he made three of, when to attack the basket. He got seven foul shots. He got two assists. He had six rebounds. He had a steal. 34 points for Ben Matherin. He was getting to the rim. One of the only guys in the Pacers who was consistently getting where they needed to go through the whole game. They were getting to the rim early, but that kind of went away. 34-6-2 is a great Matherin game. His defense was eh, eh, but if you get that kind of offensive game, that's less important. He was awesome in every way, a career night for him, and well-deserved. He was absolutely fantastic offensively in this game, and as quietly, not even really quietly, it's been a little overshadowed, I would say, by like Jarris Walker's recent success and Isaiah Jackson we'll talk about in a, in a second playing phenomenally, but like Ben Matherin's hitting some floaters, finding his spots, making passes. He, since the instant tournament, has been playing very well. 30 in Detroit, obviously. 14 on eight shots in Milwaukee with 10 free throw attempts. 13 on nine shots in Washington. He's getting to the foul line. Passing's up a little bit. Decision-making looks better. 
Lots of credit to Ben Matherin. Jordan Wara hit his shots. McConnell had 10 points, eight assists, five rebounds, plus 16 in 20 minutes. That's how bad a lot of other minutes went in this game. And Neesmith's effort and energy with 12 points and six rebounds was just phenomenal, right? They got good minutes from their bench guys. Their starters were atrocious. Um, but you know who wasn't atrocious who started was Isaiah Jackson, who is just rolling. He was kicking some butt early. He was fighting down low. He was finding spaces to score. This has to feel really good for him, I think. Just like mentally to lose that center battle early in the season had that like I, I don't want to speak for him, but I'm certain there had to be some level of self-doubt and like you know, just working on his game to be this good when called upon all season, quite frankly, like I keep saying. Uh, it says a lot about his character. Uh, he's talked about meditating and praying. He talked about that after the game today, but he also was just awesome these last this last week of this road trip. And I talked about Jairus with Ethan on yesterday's show. Isaiah Jackson's road trip. This is just bananas. 10 points and five rebounds against the Pistons on five for six shooting. Uh, nine points, three rebounds against Milwaukee on three for four shooting. 20 and 13 in Washington on 10 for 13 shooting. 12 and four against Minnesota. Didn't miss. Six for six. And then tonight was six for nine, 15 points, four rebounds. What is this run of accuracy? He has been phenomenal at finishing plays, at finding space. He has a few drives where he's like put it on the floor. He's taking a few like 10-ish foot jumpers. Ooh, is he clicking? I hope that this can stick for his sake. He worked so hard on his game all the time. And when he keeps it simple and just can play like this, he just looks great. Credit to him. We'll see. I don't know if he can play when Jalen Smith comes back. We'll see how Carlisle decides to shake out that rotation. But he's been phenomenal, and he earned a lot of praise. With the way he played, no one else really did. Pacers stink it up again. Four losses in a row. Hornets Wednesday. We'll talk with Kevin Bowen about the Pacers tomorrow and their struggles. But before we get you out of today's show, we are going to talk about the rotation for the Pacers this season and what I got wrong and what it means about the Pacers. I think this is a revealing exercise, right? I predicted their rotation before the season. How'd I do? We're about enough of the season sample to say this is close-ish to what their rotation is going to be, give or take a few minutes here or there as the season progresses and lineups potentially changes. Rick Carlisle said we will talk about that to close out today's show. Before we do any of that, though, I'm going to talk about the lovely people and one of my favorite groups over at Game Time who make the ticket buying process so easy. They've got killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee right on their app. You shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event. You shouldn't have to have guesswork. You should be able to hop on a ticket buying app, see what you're going to see when you arrive in a seat, see the price you're going to pay with no hidden fees, and know that you were getting the best price because then you don't have to shop at a bunch of other places. Game time has all of it. I know because I used it in New York to go to a Liberty game. It was super easy. It was fantastic. And their game time guarantee was my favorite part for my brain because you know you're getting the best price. If you find tickets in the same section row for less, game time's going to credit you 110% of the difference. Download the game time app, create an account, use the code Lockdown NBA for $20. How about that? Off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code L O C K E D O N N B A for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets. Lowest price guaranteed. Back here on Lockdown Pacers, thanks for making us your first listen today and every single day. Check out Lockdown Clippers for your second listen here. Darian Vaziri, talk about the team with the longest winning streak in the NBA who just kicked the Pacers' butt. Paul George getting a spittle, I would say, a spittle of booze. His first couple touches, they were louder. They slowly faded as the game progressed. Love a passionate fan base. Um, I would not be booing him if I was a fan of the team. The Pacers rotation. Let's see. Let's talk about the first what I got right and what I got wrong. My, if you'll recall, I did this exercise in August. I don't remember who my guest was for this. Um, predicting the Pacers rotation. I think it was Eddie Garrison. And I predicted the following numbers and the following 10 guys would be the Pacers rotation this season. Tyrese Halberton, 32 minutes was, was the easiest one. <laughs> I wonder if he's going to start. That one was super easy. Tyrese Halbert is currently playing 34 minutes per game. Yeah, whatever. Close enough. A little though. Miles Turner, I had second at 30 minutes. He's playing 27 minutes, but eh, close. Bruce Brown, I had third at 28 minutes. Bruce Brown, ding, ding, ding. He's playing 31 minutes. More than I thought, but again, close enough. And then we start to teeter a little bit. I had fourth in minutes for the Pacers this season. Ben Matherin, 
at 27. Ben Matherin's playing 25, but he's fifth in minutes. He dropped down to his average has changed since he came out of the starting lineup. And then I really hit the wall because my fifth guy in minutes prediction was Jairus Walker at 24. I had him and Obi Toppin splitting in my prediction, the power forward minutes. So I also had Toppin at 24. Toppin 24 is great. He's at 23.7. Walker at 24 is way off. Jairus Walker is averaging 10.5 minutes per game, and that's only in eight appearances. That doesn't even count. It's not rotation minutes when he plays. So that's a swing and a miss. So only a little off on Mather. I'm not going to kill myself for that, although it doesn't feel like he's playing that much. Nemhard, I had at 24 minutes. Uh, he's been at way less than that. He's at 18. Buddy Heald, I had at 23. He's at much more. Uh, much more. He's at 25 and a half. Isaiah Jackson, I had at 18. But whoever the backup center was, right? Just the rest of Miles Turner's minutes. That instead is Jalen Smith at 15. Although, if you take out the games, he could turn in. It's close. Isaiah Jackson's at 14 minutes. And then my last guy was Smith at 10. Although I did uh, mend that up later in the offseason. But that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I did later. And that's way off. He's at 24 and a half. So what can be learned from this exercise? The biggest misses, Neesmith and Walker. Walker too high, Neesmith too low. Everybody else within a few minutes. I was also a little high on Andrew Nemhart. So one, who's playing instead, right? Where are the minutes going that I got wrong? Well, McConnell has played 18 games and is playing 15 minutes a game when he does play. I did not have any minutes for him because I thought Andrew Nemhart would play more. And originally that was the case. But then they kind of shifted to playing both, and they needed McConnell's energy some nights, and I thought that's the right choice when they do it. So that is one thing I got wrong. The Another thing is obviously Jarris, just being completely out of the rotation on most nights. Everything else is within like three to four minutes, if you just heard me run through it. Um, but the big misses are Neesmith's at more, Walker's at less, and everybody else is close-ish, and McConnell is soaking up the Walker minutes there, right? So what have we learned is the Pacers were honest in that who they said you're going to have to earn it with this team. And I think that's a fine strategy to have, especially if you're trying to win. Now that they've lost four in a row, it's a little different, right? And I think Jarris is a good play. It makes you think differently about his development and his playing time in the future. But all this to say, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, the, the, they clearly leaned more towards winning than development in a way that I didn't necessarily expect, right? I had no McConnell in my rotation. I had a lot of Jairus Walker in my rotation. I had a lot of Ben Matherin in my rotation. I had a lot of Nemhard in my rotation. The guys who are playing more than the number I put down, Bruce Brown by three minutes, uh, Buddy Heald by about four minutes, TJ McConnell by all of his minutes are vets, and they're good players. They deserve to be playing for the Pacers, especially given how the season has gone. But I thought before the season, and this is key to note here, I had the Pacers at 12 predicted wins by now. They're at 13. They've been playing a little better, although not recently, than I predicted. They're a little bit ahead of the sportsbook right, um, prediction over under right now. But I thought they would lead a little more developy than they have. And that, I don't think, is a bad thing that they haven't. But we will see, as their record progresses, if they want to reflex back a little bit. Because, you know, Jarris not playing, is interesting to me. Him playing in the G League makes a lot of sense this week. Like, he just had his best week. We'll see what he can bounce into there. But the big misses are just that the Pacers have clearly leaned out of, and this is telling, leaned out of development mode. They want to win. They're playing the guys who give them the best chance to win every game. You can never fault a team for that. But maybe there is something to blending those things a little more as they're in their losing streak. But the ones I got too high on, the numbers I was too high on, Jairus Walker, Ben Matherin, Andrew Nemhard, even the backup center spot a little bit, is they're young. They're young guys that I thought should play to develop beyond, of course, them playing to help the Pacers win. And the ones I was too low on, Neesmith is, is the exception because it wasn't clear exactly where he'd fit in, but he's earned every minute he's gotten this season. But I was too low on his minutes. I was too low on Toppin's minutes. Uh, and then the other ones are all vets. So the Pacers clearly have chosen in their position battles vets at our vets and in production over development. And I think that's fine, but that's where they are right now. And that is how they will have to approach any thoughts about changing the rotation is can they change it and continue down their path and goals of winning? Or does any change also come with a price of leaning a little more towards development? I have to hold myself accountable though. I was wrong about how the Pacers might approach that exercise, but they've made 
solid enough choices this season and totally justifiable ones at that about how their team is and the direction they are headed tomorrow. Like I said, Kevin Bowen's joining us talking state of the Pacers. They're losing. How can they fix it? Do they need to make any changes? Will they beat the Hornets and bounce back? What's all going on? Kevin Bowen is always very good at covering teams, being very honest and using his voice in a productive way to talk about things that are going wrong with the Pacers. We'll talk Hornets and Grizzlies after those games happen this week. So lots of fun stuff coming here on the Locked On Pacers podcast. Thank you all so much for listening. Much appreciated, even during losing times for this Pacers team. I'm on Twitter at Tony R. East. The show is there at Locked On Pacers. Please direct any comments or concerns to those places. Thank you all for listening. Have a great day. We'll see you soon.